Welcome, everyone, to the show Transforming Lives. We are so glad that you are here. We have a power pack show for you today. It's all about divorce care. We're having a bit of a technical difficulties, but we're going to get the show started. Um, you're here on time, and we're glad that you're on time. And so at some point, um, the radio station will work its way in. So please bear with us. But we're going to get in the interest of time. We will get started. We have a full house. We have persons on Facebook, um, Channel 974, YouTube, and we have you in the room. So we have a full house. So let's get started with prayer. Bow with me, please, as we invite Jesus at the center of it all. Heavenly Father, for a beautiful day, we give you thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss such a very important subject. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to be at the very center of it all. Give us wisdom, give us knowledge, give us understanding. And at the very end, may trans transformational learning take place. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. So thank you so much. Like I said, we have a power pack room and we have two dynamic ladies in the room. We have the one and only Pastor Rosemary Pina. She's the senior pastor. Uh, she's the senior pastor of Legacy Church, a church that I love. So I'll put that plug in there, a church that I love. Um, so she is a transformational. I mean, this lady has the word within her and she knows how to put that word out there with power. So I'm just glad to welcome her to the show. Welcome, Pastor Rosemary, to the show, Transforming Lives. So good to be with you. You know how much I love you. <laughs> Thank you so very much. And also in the room is somebody I admire, respect, and had the opportunity to spend lots of time with in the last couple of weeks. She is the one and only Miss Rhea Butler, and she is the leader of a Legacy Divorce Care Group. Now, she's some other things. Both of these ladies, they wear many hats, motivational speaker, pastor. She's many hats. She wears many hats, but we're glad also to have these women of wisdom and resilience in the room. Welcome, Pastor Butler, to the show, Transforming Lives. Thank you for having me. I see you just gave me a different, another title, but it's okay. Yes, I mean, I'm okay. prophetic. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor has no problem with that. That's probably prophetic. So, I mean, we're talking about a big subject, divorce a big taboo subject, as a matter of fact, still many places a taboo subject. Pastor and leader, Rhea, what give you both, you ladies, both the audacity to come on the show to discuss a taboo topic like divorce? What say E? Pastor, starting with Pastor Rosemary. The audacity to discuss audacity. Yes, <laughs> the audacity. Yeah, well, you know, um, I do believe that that God has something to say um, with all of the issues that we face um, at any moment. And the church has, I, I believe, in a, in a largely neglected the conversation around divorce and in many ways misinterpreted um, the conversation, but it was a hot topic, not just now, it was actually one of the hot topics that Jesus had to deal with when he came on the scene, uh, because human relationships have always um, created spaces where there's, there's a challenge between what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is biblical, what is not biblical, and largely I think the church has been silent around it. 
and oftentimes very dismissing of persons that have had to take the route of divorce. And there's, there's just need for conversation, um, sound, biblical, balanced um, conversation because God doesn't, God meets us at every point of need. And so if there is a point of need, then we have to find out how God approaches it and how he meets us there. That's, that's my take on it. So, so thank you for, for that, you know, that nice introduction PM, but the thing that actually gives me the audacity to be able to accept an invitation to talk about divorce and divorce care is because it is something that I would have journeyed through. And I do realize that because there are so many questions, well, there were so many questions that I would have had uh, along my journey and through my own process, uh, it's only fitting that the opportunity is provided or a safe space is provided for other persons that may have had similar questions. Um, so for me, that gives me the audacity to be able to speak about it because the silence, as PM would have indicated, the silence has to be broken about it. It's not where we have to sit in silence and suffer in silence. It's not, it's one thing to just sit in silence, but if you suffer in silence, that's a whole that's other a double ball whammy. game. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole other ball game. So at this point, um, somebody, I mean, for me, I, I just felt that there was an urgency to it. And it was necessary to actually be the person that actually opens my mouth and say, you know something, you know, it's no longer the time to sit and suffer in silence. It's time for us to address some of these issues and have the wider conversations. Well, thank you so very much. Great answers. Um, in terms of a working definition, just so there's no confusion from where you sit, what is your definition of divorce? And is there a separation between divorce is there a difference, sorry, between divorce and separation? Is there a difference? So I would say uh, divorce is the finality, you know, um, legally, where um, all contracts, covenants are broken. Um, separation um, is, is when, when you're separated from one another, but haven't necessarily made a decision yet. Um, to go through it on a legal basis. Uh, some people stay separated, but um, stay married um, legally. I think, you know, and, and I've known of cases where people are separated for years, like, you know, 10, 15 years, um, but never make it official. Um, at that point, they are in all essence divorced, um, but I think the, the, the finality of it, when you make it, or when you break the contract legally, that's divorce. Um, if you're still in it, but, but it's not legally broken, then you're separated by definition. My take on it though. Anything to add to that, Rio? That was a complete yeah, answer. You I, just... I think that was a thorough enough answer for me. I yeah. thought it was quite... Claire. Okay, so this is another interesting one. What kind of people get divorced? What kind? What kinds of people? Let's deal with that. What kinds? I I don't think there there is a kind of people that actually get divorced, and I I I would want to caution people from even having to have the mindset that there are certain kinds of people that actually go through a divorce. It can actually happen to anyone, and even by way of um, just having to give a little insight, uh, talking about some of the women that's a part or some of the persons that would be a part of a group such as divorce care. It touches different sectors, um, different spheres of influence. I mean, women and persons from, I mean, every walk of life, they are part of really, would have experienced divorce. Um, or possibly maybe going through the process of divorce or even going through the process of separation. So I would not necessarily want to coin it to say that there is a certain kind of person that actually goes through divorce. Thank you so much. Pastor, anything to add to that or that's a complete um, yeah, answer? I, I think that was a very good answer. And, and the reality is, I don't know too many people that go into um, covenant marriage and, and going through all of that, that say, 
I'm going in this to get divorced. So uh, it happens and it happens to uh, people in, in many different spaces and for many different reasons. So I don't think that you can um, say these kinds of people or that kind of people uh, get divorced. It happens. Um, I don't know that anyone will go through the trouble of getting married for the purpose of divorce, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it is it is life and and you know life happens to all of us in one way or another. All right, at this off, welcome to the show, Pastor Williams. Um, and welcome to the show, Dave. I see you made it in. Um, I hope we're live on the radio now. No, we're not. Okay, not yet. So so we'll continue. We'll continue with the conversation. All right. So we have a videotape um, that we'd like you to listen to. Pastor Williams, can you play that tape? And we will follow up with additional questions. Go right ahead, dealing with who gets a divorce, addressing that very same question. Who gets a divorce? church when I got divorced people in the city turned on me that I didn't even know cared. preachers and ministers and churches that used to invite me to preach still will not invite me to preach there were words that had gotten out about me that were devastating to my soul I felt pain in a way I had never felt before I didn't cheat on my ex I didn't beat on my ex we had irreconcilable differences that could not be resolved because the fact of the matter is we were not on the same page I got married and didn't understand what marriage was. Which is what the greater majority of you don't know because we come to church and we shout and we jump, but we don't deal with the realities of how to live life. And I went through a divorce and when I went through that divorce, it was devastating. Wait for it. And because my heart is for the people of God, I kept preaching and teaching at such a high level, the church kept growing. And then a new group of people started to gravitate to my ministry and call me throughout the world to minister the gospel. During this time frame, I am literally losing my mind. Nobody knows it because I've been given a measure of strength and tolerance, wait for it, that is abnormal. Based on the fact that I have strong parents, I've been taught strong faith, so I'm functioning while I'm truly a dysfunctional person. And this is what I've discovered about people. People don't really care what you're going through as long as you can help them. So I'm stressed out, but I'm still preaching. I'm telling people, now they know I just got divorced, but they need me to come to the hospital. They need me to lay hands. They need me to do this. They need me to do that. And that's fine. That's my responsibility. But where I messed up was this. I should have took a break. I should have stopped and said, hey, I'm going to leave for a year and I'm going to get my mind right. But see, when you do stuff like that, church is conditioned by religious people to judge you. We're supposed to be the place of mending and healing, but somewhere down the line, they started becoming the place of condemnation and judgment. So when pastors go through, they feel like they got to hide everything because if they don't, y'all going to fire them. Your medical doctor went through a divorce, and guess what he still did? Perform surgery on you. Okay. Your I lawyer went through a divorce, and guess what right happened? There. You still called him to handle your court case. Your pastor goes through a divorce, and all of a sudden, he's not qualified to preach. He's supposed to be held at a higher, a higher esteem. In life? Life can't happen to me. So then in American society, I became one of the first preachers to ever go public and discuss the, 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 the hurting things that happen in a divorce. So all of a sudden now, I'm getting calls from bishops and leaders who have mega churches staring me in the face and breaking down crying and saying, I don't know what to do, I wanna leave my wife. Watch this, and because of the ministry God gave me, I was able to preach their families into restoration. Y'all clapping. But do you know what that did to me psychologically? How are you gonna fix day marriage? At my expense, y'all don't wanna talk, but this is how I'm talking to God. And now I'm over here by myself. My ex All right, thank you so very much. So our question coming out of that video 
here is a pastor saying that he should have taken a break. Is there a healing process? When one goes through a divorce, is there a necessary healing process? Ms. Butler? Uh, thank you for that question, um, Jackie. So of course, there is definitely a necessary healing process that anybody, anybody that would have gone through divorce or experienced a divorce um, would need to go through because as he would have indicated, even in the video, there's a whole lot of pain, there's a whole lot of devastation, there's a whole lot of things, there are a whole lot of things that actually need to be worked through um, before or, well, you know, as you're going through it, there are some things that need to be worked through. So let's talk about some of the hurts. Let's talk about the grief because you would have been in that place where you would have lost some things. Let's talk about some of the, 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 the realities and even the mental issues because of the burden of it. And depending on whether or not you have children involved, um, all of that, those are things that would have to be addressed in order for you to come to that place of healing, even the place of forgiveness. Because sometimes even too, you may have to go through the process of forgiving yourself. You may have to go through that process of forgiving the, the other person, the, the spouse or the partner, whoever it is, or however you want to term it. You have to go through all, and all of that is necessary as a part of your healing process. So there is indeed a healing process and it may look different. It's not a, a, a process that is just a one, two, three, four, five, six step. No, everybody's healing process is different. So you have to be open to it. And it's, it's I, I try to encourage, uh, especially those persons that are part of the group and even those persons that I have conversation with um, on a daily basis, um, and you have to be open to there being healing that's available and being open to wanting to be in a safe space where that healing process can actually take place because it's not something that any individual should want to do on their own by themselves. It's a very, very difficult time. Um, and you do not want a journey by yourself. So you want to make sure that you are in a safe space where you can actually have the support that can help you to journey along the way to your healing. I just want to say to those of you tuning in live on Global 99.5, we offer our apologies for joining you at such a late stage because of the challenges that we face. But I just want to wish those of you a pleasant um, good afternoon and um, encourage you to continue to share the link. Uh, Global 99.5, we hear every Sunday, 4 to 5, as you know. We got a late start, but we will make up for that time. And before we go back into our topic about divorce, I just want to share with you a special forum coming up that I wish for those of you to be a part of it. It's Rite of Passage Project and Uplifting Men's Ministry present a one day virtual event in commemoration of International Human Rights Day under the theme, the right of the liberty and safety, gender-based violence, rape awareness forum. And that will be this coming Tuesday, actually Tuesday, December 28th from four to 6 p.m. The coordinators are Kendra Bow and Dave Williams. And the objective of this forum is to identify what is rape according to the law and different types of rape to discuss the harmful cultural practice of rape in our society and the beliefs that perpetrate its myths and facts to raise awareness on the universal right of life, liberty and safety of every human being equality, teach men and boys to get consent, to raise awareness on mental health and the trauma associated with sexual and gender-based violence to build self-esteem and provide hope to victims of abuse. I will put the number in the chat for those of you listening on radio and via television, 433-6917, 433-6917. You can WhatsApp me. I will share more information with you. I can share the link so you can be a part of this program. That's a project, Rite of Passage and Uplifting Men collaborating together to present a one day virtual event in commemoration of international human rights, talking about gender-based violence and rape awareness. Folks, I wanna welcome you here on this Sunday afternoon, once again on Transforming Lives Global 99.5. We're we here every Sunday, four to five, and we're talking about rape. We're on cable TV 974, Facebook, YouTube channel. And so I wanna continue, ask that you continue to join us and those of you just late, 
and we will have to play hopefully that quote uh, from the pastor again at some point in the show. Thank you, ladies, for being a part of the program. Jackie, continue on. Thank you so very much, the one and only Mr. Dave Williams. Glad we're on back on the radio. And so we're talking about divorce care and that big taboo subject, divorce. And um, our leader, leader um, Rhea Butler, was just sharing some information in terms of the healing process. And Ms. Rhea, you mentioned a very big word, forgiveness. Is forgiveness a key part of that healing process? If it is, what does it look like? And is it important to, well, does it matter who forgives? The person, the guilty party, not so guilty party, or is there such thing as only one guilty party? Speak to us a little bit about what that forgiveness process looks like. Forgiveness is a major part. It's a major part of the healing process. Um, and it really says to, it, it's all about you in that moment. Forgiveness is, is for you as the individual. It doesn't matter what the other person may be thinking, what they may be doing. It's all about you in that moment. And you just simply saying, you know something, I release you. I release you and this is about me in this moment. They could choose to, to receive that forgiveness from you or whatever it is that they wanna do. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really about you and you coming to grips with your own self to say, you know something, I release them. I do not, they don't owe me anything. There's no debt that they owe me because sometimes we think that the other person owes us something, but really and truly, it's not about that. It's simply saying, you owe me nothing. I release you from everything. And I choose, I choose to move on. I choose to continue living my life um, regardless of what things may look like, regardless of how things may seem, regardless of what people might say, I, I still release you, you know? So it's really having to release that person uh, from the debt that you may have thought at some point that they would have owed you because of whatever may have transpired as it relates to divorce and in the actual relationship. Thank you so much. So Pastor, I'm gonna ask you in the interest of time because I want to get to the room and get some of those questions. So you're gonna have two questions, all right? So talking a bit about divorce once again, is divorce, there was some time I remember I grew up in another denomination where divorce was presented as the unpardonable sin. Is being divorced, are you now participating in the unpardonable sin? That's question number one. And question number two, does God expect for you to forgive? So two, two questions for the one and only Pastor Rosemary. Uh, the one and only. Um, so we got to take it back to his, uh, history, right? Uh, a lot of times where we get in trouble in interpreting the scripture, is when we read it as 21st century Christians and we don't consider the context or the original audience, right? So the, the question around divorce, um, like I said earlier, but uh, for those of you that are, were not on the radio, um, was a question, it was a to hot topic in Jesus's time, but how he responds to the question, which was brought to him by a Pharisee, is it lawful for, uh, a man to divorce his wife. Um, you have to go even further into the history to understand what was really happening in that moment. Historically, and there were two places in the Old Testament where um, divorce was mentioned and where it was granted, right? Where God accepted and understood um, that divorce can happen. Um, and so the question was based on the historical context because there were two uh, different groups of, of um, Jew, Jewish believers. Uh, one group uh, had a practice of what is called, called any cause divorce, right? Any cause divorce, which was um, kind of a, a, a deviation from what Moses had uh, instructed that, that uh, a divorce can happen under certain conditions. 
the any cause divorce was was popular at the time that Jesus came on the scene. So you got to understand this. So because we read it from a whole different context. And then we put these laws and these regulations in place that the Bible doesn't have. Any cause divorce meant that as a man, I could divorce and give a certificate of divorce to my wife because she burnt the meal that evening or because uh, somebody came along that, that was better looking or, I mean, just because I was mad and I felt like it. Any cause, any reason, and you could, the man, remember now that in that time also, you have to put in consideration that women were property to a certain extent. God works, and this is a, a, a reality that we have to put in place in our minds, is that while God may allow something, that doesn't mean that he is for something or that he is in that um, situation. From the time that Adam fell, God was redeeming humanity. He didn't do it all at once. He was training us and, and leading us and transforming and bringing us back to repentance and uh, releasing us to judgment and bringing us back to repentance and, and doing a work that prepared us for Jesus Christ, right? All the way up to John the Baptist, uh, God was preparing the way for us to come into his ideal in Jesus Christ. So when Jesus was asked, um, can a man just give a certificate of divorce to his wife um, at, for any cause? It was a flippant uh, a use of the scripture that it was violated to the point that, um, that men were divorcing women for any little simple crazy reason, right? Now, when Jesus answered and he says, uh, he says that that uh, divorce can happen under a certain condition. He wasn't also just saying that there's only one condition for which divorce can happen, which is where uh, at times the, the new believers have put it. Unless there is sexual immorality, immorality, you don't have a cause for divorce. And then in certain denominations or certain um, uh, uh, belief systems. It's like there is absolutely no reason for divorce. Um, that's not true. While God, while Jesus affirmed covenant, affirmed marriage, which he needed to in a time where um, any reason is a is a cause for divorce, he needed to go back to the sanctity of marriage and support. Uh, the necessity of covenant and how God views covenant. So God honors covenant, but this, these are human realities where things happen that, um, that can grant a person uh, to, have, to have the right to, to divorce. There's an interesting passage that those persons that um, do not agree on divorce failed to even look into. Um, Again, remember that that women were were pre, pretty much um, in different spaces. Like we, thank God, we're not there anymore. But a, a father can sell his daughter into slavery, right? That was the time. That's not to say that God agreed with it, but He put order around certain things. Um, but even in the Old Testament, in Exodus chapter twenty-one. A slave woman is giving a, given a right to divorce her husband, even if she's brought into it as a slave. And the premise is this, if he marries someone else and he fails to give to the woman what he has agreed in the covenant marriage, right? There's when in the covenant vows. So we have vows that we make in covenant. I'm going to read it to you so you don't take my word for it. Exodus 21 verses 10 through 11. If a man who has married a slave wife takes another wife for himself, he must not neglect the rights of the first wife to food, clothing, and sexual intimacy. If he fails in any of these three obligations, she may leave as a free woman without making any payment. So a slave woman was given a right, that's huge, in the Old Testament 
to leave her husband without paying for her freedom. Because remember, there was the slaves in the Old Testament within the Jewish culture can buy themselves out of slavery. I mean, saying she doesn't have to pay him for her freedom if he fails to honor the covenant vows, which was three things as a, even as a slave wife, she had a right to. She had a right to food. She had a right to clothing, that's provision. And she had a right to sexual intimacy. So if there was any neglect in any of those things, a slave woman, I have to say that again, because if in Old Testament covenant, it was, it was allowed as a cause for divorce, Jesus did not undo those, that paradigm, okay? Now, that is not to say that we have a right now for any cause divorce or that we can be flippant. I don't like you anymore. Um, we should honor marriage and it is a sacred um, covenant. But I've seen where the church has instructed, especially women, um, to remain in abusive, to remain in damaging covenants, um, and to stay and take, just pray and stay, even though he's beaten you um, every other day. Pray and stay, even though you know that he has walked out on you and he's not honoring the covenant. Pray and stay, even though there's no more sexual intimacy, so you're in a place of neglect. Pray and stay has been the messaging to women. And it is unbiblical. The message is unbiblical. You have a right. If there has been sexual immorality, you have an out. If there has been neglect of provision, and if there has been neglect of intimacy in the marriage, you have a right. Um, if there definitely has been abuse or any abusive um, situation, you have a right um, to exit. And, and you, don't, you don't have to exit with the burden of, um, of the Lord uh, chastising you. So how does it relate to males? I see the question. The same, if there is, if there is immorality, you have a right. If there is abuse, because unfortunately gender-based violence while women and children are mostly um, affected by gender-based bias, uh, a bi violence, it does happen to men also. And we cannot be silent about that, okay? If there is abuse, if there is uh, neglect um, of, of the marriage bed on either part, and when I say neglect, I'm talking about an unwillingness to work through um, anything that stands in the way of intimacy. Marriage is a union and a covenant between two partners. And so it is both, both have the responsibility to work towards their intimacy, uh, to work towards uh, their union and to build the covenant in healthy ways. And so um, there, it's not just uh, female centric is what I'm saying. The out in the Old Testament was necessary for the, the women slaves because they were property to a certain extent. And um, they had the protection of the man. And this is part of why Jesus had to affirm um, covenant because um, when a woman was given a certificate of divorce in those times by a man, she, she was left without protection. Um, she was left in a very vulnerable um, space um, sociologically as well. So we have to consider that. So the point is there, there is a place for divorce. Um, one, according to Deuteronomy 24 and one, um, which then is affirmed by Jesus in Matthew 19, adultery, um, emotional and physical neglect, according to Exodus 21, 10 through 11, affirmed by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, and abandonment and abuse included in neglect as affirmed in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 7. And so, again, all of those reasons are, are not necessarily a reason for you to flippantly say, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, I think that 
um, for all of us, um, we need to look at the, the beauty of, of covenant marriage. And we have to just remove it from um, putting the, the burden on just the women um, and, and the messaging. So for example, I'll give you another um, thing that happens uh, where I have seen it abused, the messaging abused. Women submit to your husband because he is the head of the home. And we hit that scripture over and over uh, and over again. Is he abusive? Yes, but submit. Is he uh, uh, in, in adultery? Yes, but submit. We're in the Caribbean. We know that even in churches, pastors, whatever, uh, they have a second family. Yes, but submit. Because your instruction is to submit to your husband, regardless of what kind of a husband he is, submit. But you got to reel that scripture a little bit back further. And the instruction is not just woman submit. The instruction is submit to one another, right? The submission is for both parties. How that submission plays out is dependent upon the, the way that God created man and created woman. A man requires, it's part of, his uh, identity and just part of who he is that um, he, he, his ego requires affirmation, right? So a woman that is loving her husband well will affirm him. His, 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 um, the way that the Lord made the male, um, they need respect. They need to feel respected in the home by their wives, by their children. When a man feels respected at home, he feels uh, like he is a man, you know, he doesn't question his manhood. He doesn't question his identity, but here's the deal. We put that burden on the woman and forget to give the, the way of submission for the man is clearly laid out as well. He may not be required to, he, he doesn't have to be told respect your wife because man, men are, are intrinsically, um, given that, you know, uh, a woman does not need to feel respected. What she does need is to feel loved, right? So a man intrinsically needs to feel respected. You can respect the woman all you want, but if you don't adorn her with love, that respect doesn't speak to her womanness. It is love that, that speaks to her. So I think when we really look at it balanced and biblically, the man is given a harder job than the woman. We are trained to respect authority. We've been raised to, I'm Latina, so I was raised to serve my family. I was raised in the kitchen. My mother served my father hand and foot. That came automatic for me, right? But uh, what the need is for the woman is to feel loved. And I don't know that there is a woman that is loved well, that doesn't submit, unless she has other issues, unless that's she, a, a she has one. other things, right? So I think the harder, but, but the most neglected instruction is to the man, because if you listen to the way that God said he is to love his wife, it is a tall order. order. Husband, love your wife, as Christ loved the church and gave his life for her. That's huge, but we don't say it enough. And I think if we can begin to have the conversation around what does it look like for a man to love his wife? To a, what, is Jesus, what is Jesus doing with his bride right now? He died for her. He adorned her. He he poured his oil upon her. He poured his glory to her. Um, there is so much more. And then the beauty of that is that there is a, a way of submission that speaks to how God created us. Woman, submit to your husband. Respect his voice. Respect his leadership. When a woman submits and respects his, a man's leadership, He's going to feel safe. He's going to feel uh, uh, like the man of the house. Man, love your wife as Christ loved the church. And when a woman is adorned and loved 
when a woman is loved in her language, because for you to love your wife as Christ loved the church, then you have to make an investment in knowledge. You have to get to know her. You have to learn what speaks to her. Is her love language gifts? Is her love language affirmation? Do you need to come up to your wife and cuddle her and, and hold her and hug her? Because you can provide for her, but if her language is in quality time and you don't have time for her, it doesn't matter how much you lavish her with gifts. She's going to still feel lonely. She's going to still feel. And when a woman feels that way, then, you know, that's where the, the stuff begins. Um, but so once we lay that foundation, right, I believe that the church, as it was in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, um, Moses gave a paradigm for when a certificate of divorce was to be given. And by virtue of semantics, there was a group of Jews that took that and took it to the left. I mean, they made a whole culture of any cause divorce. If I feel like today, I just don't want my wife, I give her. And in that culture, the men had the right to write off the certificate of divorce. So the woman could wake up with her whole world devastated because he just felt like it. Um, so they had taken what, what Moses had laid out as a cause and they had taken it to a whole other level. Um, we've done the same thing. We've taken what Jesus said. We haven't done the history. We haven't done the study. We haven't read it as, um, we haven't looked at it as how he presented it to his hearers because they were coming at him to trap him because of the fight that was between two different opinions, which was any cause. And then the other camp said, there is no cause. You got to stay in it regardless of whatever. So for us as the church, we got to present a biblical and a more balanced view, which is we honor covenant. God honors covenant. God honors marriage. God, there is an ideal for God. My parents are, have been married for 46 years now. I was hoping that would be my story, but I found myself on the other side of this thing, having to make a hard decision. Not a decision I made without prayer, not a decision I made without fasting, not a decision that I made without going to the Lord and saying, I just can't work with, lead with, co-pastor with this kind of, paradigm. I, I can't. If you make somebody a victim, I'm going to fight for them. So I can't fight for what is out of order in the house of God. And, and so I had to make my exit, but not because I went into it wanting, wanting to do so. Now, when we say, if you make your exit now, that is the one sin that got, no, 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 no. That's not biblical. <laughs> I'm That's so glad you took the time to lay the foundation for that area, because I think um, women all over, not just in the Bahamas, around the world are stuck in marriages because of that one big issue. So I allowed you full time to explain that because I honestly believe that persons will leave from this show as a result of that explanation, transformed by the power of God. Understanding. Thank you. I, I think the church has a... Uh, has a duty. So for me, even as a pastor, my duty is to do everything within my power to try to bring reconciliation. Right. And, and in cases where, you know, I'm not going to try to ring, bring reconciliation if the man tried to kill the woman last week, or if she tried to kill him last week, at that point, we have to look at what is toxic and and we're not trying to reconcile things that are toxic, although God is a God of miracles and he has done some amazing miracles um, through our ministry as well. Um, so reconciliation should be the first position of the church, but never to discard people because they, they have found themselves in a space where they have to um, divorce. I think we create safe spaces so that they can navigate through the different um, um, stages of grief, like a uh, minister Ria just talked about, um, any point of break, any kind of situation where something ends, um, brings you into a grief process. So we have to create spaces around as a church for healing. Now you asked on, on forgiveness and here's the deal. 
um, whether, I don't believe that there is necessarily any paradigm where you can put the sole blame on one person. And that's not to say that there is not toxic abuse on the, on the one side, but for every Jezebel, there's an Ahab, right? At some point, you had to have allowed certain things. So there's two processes of forgiveness, which Rhea talked about. Number one, you're going to have to forgive yourself, come to that place of forgiveness for yourself, because we beat ourselves up. How did I do this? And how come I let it happen this long? Why didn't I see it before? Why didn't I see it before I married? Depending on the situation that is happening, right? We have to um, get out of the weight of condemnation and guilt because guilt has no traction. Guilt and condemnation has no movement for your tomorrow. So you have to come up out of the guilt and the condemnation surrounding it um, and bring forgiveness to yourself. The other thing is this, that wherever there has been fault, wherever, um, and, and again, every situation is different. Some some separations and some divorce happen amicably. Some come in, in the heat of uh, a lot of uh, trauma and, and there's trauma surrounding it. Um, but forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. And what that means is you have to take the journey to forgiveness, even if the, the offending party never sees their fault, never sees their blame, never sees the weight of their trespass and come to you in repentance. It is a gift you give yourself. And what you're saying in forgiveness is not what you did was okay. It's not what you did was right. Or I'm in agreement with your way out or with your exit or what you did while we were married. What you say is you're no longer a part of my future. And so I'm going to release you. I'm going to release you. So when we do, we're, we're big. In our church, we're big on uh, healing in every possible way that, that it can happen. And healing for us comes through the preaching of the word. Healing for us comes uh, through prayer. Healing comes in our worship. Healing comes through deliverance. We cast out devils. Healing comes through inner healing, where you sit with a counselor and you go through the, your false belief systems and you cancel um, false beliefs. And the process of deliverance too, not just when it happens in an altar, but when I take somebody through deliverance, when it comes to forgiveness, there is a phrase that they have to say, uh, which with every person that they release to forgiveness. And it is this, I release you to the joy of my forgiveness. I release you. I, I love the that. Joke of my forgiveness, because when you are unforgiving, it is a burden on you. It is a burden on your future. It is a burden on your health. It is a burden on your body. It is a burden to you. Um, someone said it this way. I don't know who it was, so I can't quote them. But unforgiveness is drinking poison, expecting somebody else to die. Right. So we've heard that quote over and over again. But here's the reality. I sent this to my sister the other day. One of my um, sisters in the gospel, she posted this um, and I'm going to read it to you. Just take the time to read it to you uh, for a moment. My sister had written something about or she posted a TikTok on her WhatsApp status. And was this man talking about God is the one who forgives. As for me, I'm holding on to it. Like, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to hold on to the unforgiveness. And because, you know, God is big enough to forgive you, you, and he's your judge. You go to him, but I'm, I'm not letting you go. And I, so I wrote my sister, this is my biological sister. I wrote her and I said, baby girl, I need you to let it go because on every level you're hurting yourself, holding on to these people. And I know, I don't know her full story, so I know there's some things that, that people have done to you that is unimaginable and you can't even begin to think if I forgive them, I'm saying that to them, it's okay that they did it. I said to her, that's not what it is. But what you're saying is 
what you did to me doesn't have to be a part of me in a damaging way for the rest of my life. But here's scientifically what has been proven. What bitterness does to your body, because there's no unforgiveness without bitterness, right? We know that. That's why it's like drinking toxic. Feeling bitter interferes with the body's hormonal and immune systems, according to Karsten Roche, an associate professor of psychology at Concordia University in Montreal, and an author of chapter in the new uh, of a chapter in the new book. Studies have shown that bitter, angry people have higher blood pressure and heart rate, and are more likely to die of heart disease and other illnesses. Forgiveness is for you. The data that negative mental states cause heart problems is just stupendous. The data is just as established as smoking and the size of the effect is the same. Dr. Charles Race in psychology, when psychologically, when we feel negatively towards someone, our bodies instinctively prepare to fight. That person, which leads to changes such as an increase in blood pressure, we run hot as our inflammatory system responds to dangers and threats. Now that's why it's become a part of our lingo. I ran hot, buddy. <laughs> I saw them and I ran hot. Well, it's really what's happening. Physically happening. Body. We're on fire. Feeling this, feeling this way in short term might not be dangerous. It might even be helpful to fight off an enemy. But the problem with bitterness is that it goes on and on. When our bodies are constantly primed to fight someone, the increase in blood pressure and in chemicals such as C-reactive protein eventually take a toll on the heart and other parts of the body. That data, the data that negative mental states cause heart problems is just stupendous. So um, in another, uh, one of our trainers, her name is uh, Marty Weebles, She's a Christian psychologist and we had her train our um, inner healing um, leaders and all of that. We're gonna have her do more training with our leaders in 2022. But she wrote a, a, a book called Core Healing from Trauma. And she talks about what happens in our bodies, right? Um, cortisol increases when you're in that space of fight or flight. Um, and sometimes there's what she calls an amygdala hijack. So you hijack your, your, your systems in your body because you are in a continuous fight or flight mode. Right. At every thought of them, you're ready to fight. Yeah, not, it's absolutely it, not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Not sustainable. And um, we've allowed... We've allowed yeah. um, this dialogue. I mean, the persons in the group are saying, allow Pastor Rosemary to speak because this is good information. Amazing teacher. I mean, I'm looking at the group. They felt like this is a balanced discussion. So you always, and we have men, several men in the group. I'm saying she's also addressing men and women. So thank you so very much. They feel good point, good stuff. So we have, I'm trying to take some of these comments in the group. Okay, I promised you, I'll give you an opportunity to ask uh, few questions. We started a bit late and I want to keep that commitment. So I'm going to allow you to unmute your mic and let me see the first person to raise their hands. Um, any questions? I saw, I think a question in the group. Um, Roger, do you have a question? You normally have a question there, a burning question you want to ask. You can unmute, unmute your mic. Anyone with a question? All right, I see the, the comments are all in the chat. Um, the man is king of his castle and his world is lower no matter what. Um, happy wife, oh, happy wife, happy life. Oh yes, I don't think we'll have any problem with that comment. So let's go back just in the interest of time, we are narrowing down, but we wanna get back to divorce care. Um, tell us a little bit Rhea, I became, I'm not even sure how I heard. Okay, I, I think Katrina now that I think about it. You know, Katrina is that kind of person within the church that is sharing any and every information. I mean, she, every day she's sharing something about legacy. And I think she was the one that introduced, I knew a little bit about you before, but introduced me to um, divorce care. And I could tell you, I've been positively changed by the information that was shared. 
tell us a little bit about the Boas Care. What kind of space? Is it a safe care, um, space? And what kind of things are discussed, um, you know, during our meetings, you know, at Divorce Care? Tell us about Divorce Care. Thank you so much, Jackie. I really appreciate that, uh, that question. So Divorce Care is, it's a pretty much a safe space that we have created that allows persons who are separated possibly in that space of going through a divorce, who's possibly even been divorced for quite some time, and they did not necessarily have a safe space that they can actually navigate through some of the different phases or the experiences that they may actually go through while in the divorce. So some of the topics that we touch on, we talk about deep hurt, we talk about road to recovery, we talk about anger, grief, depression, loneliness, fears, anxiety, we talk about the, the money too. I know that was a hot topic. That was a big one. Had our, yeah, that was a big topic. Um, and we also talk about family and friends, we talk about the conflict, we talk about singleness. Yeah, that was a hot one too. Yes. <laughs> we also talk about brighter days. So what, what, what persons can actually expect um, after having going through divorce or even in that space of separation. So it's definitely a safe space where persons can actually come together. And one of the things that we found was very interesting, of course, because as persons began going through the process of, of having to share, a lot of the participants began to realize, oh, your story is very similar to mine. Or that's a piece of my story there. And now the women were, they were like, oh my gosh, I'm actually not alone. I'm actually not going out of my mind because we start to hear a lot of the thought processes. As we share the thought processes, a lot of persons were like, oh, so I'm not crazy. I'm not I'm going to crazy. Inject. Right. That was a big person thought that they were crazy. You know, it's just happening. So that was a big yeah. one. It definitely was a big one. Um, so we definitely, we look forward to having to create such spaces. It's a 13 week uh, program that we actually have that we go through. And it's been an exciting journey, I can say. Uh, even from just the camaraderie and the fellowship among women, I think the most beautiful thing for me is being able to see that even though it was, I was like, okay, PM, I, I feel like I need to go ahead and do this thing. I wasn't sure whether or not persons would have actually responded to it, but you know, we had the, the evangelist like the Katrina who was talking to people and we had many other persons within the community and just people even seeing things being posted publicly that caused there to be a drawing and say, you know something, I'm not gonna be ashamed. I'm gonna say, I need help. I'm gonna say yes to my own journey of healing and Right now, I can say even by way of this cohort, there has been a true community that has been formed because I could see where uh, the women are actually saying, you know, something. you need help with this, I can help you with that. Do you need help with this? I can help you with that. Having the prayer, the prayer requests, the moments of prayers and where we can actually come into agreement with, with others. And, and it's to the point now where we were, we've already completed our 12th week. We're on our 13th week. And the ladies are already saying, listen, I don't know what's supposed to happen after this, but we have to keep this going. Absolutely. So they, <laughs> yes, they're already excited and ready to go for the next round. They're like, so what do we do from here? Do we do this again? Or what, what else do you have for us? But it just goes to show it, it really just requires you to take the first step. Take the first step and say, I'm not afraid to raise my hand. I'm not afraid to put a bet on myself. Even, you know, some persons may say, well, why are you saying bad? But you know something, I'm not afraid to do something for me in this moment, especially even as um, a lot of the, the persons who are in our group right now, they're, they're mothers. So they have been making decisions. A lot of them have made decisions based on how is this going to affect my children? But in this moment, it's about you putting the mask on yourself first and saying, I need to get myself together so that I can be of help. I can be of assistance. I can be of use to my own children. So Absolutely. for anybody that wants to, of course, um, if, if it's something that you feel the need to want to journey through, like I said, it's not just simply for those persons that may be at a place of divorce. Um, you may be in that place, you're just, you're just not sure. And you want to be able to safely navigate some of the thought processes that you may be having. This is still an ideal spot for you to be. It's not where and Jackie, you can you could correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> we don't tell you what decision to make Absolutely by not. way of the program itself. It's not me telling you, you need to do this, or this is the decision that you need to make. 
It allows you to go through the process, go through a lot of the activities. You have a book that you work through. You have videos. Uh, that's what I wanted you to mention that there's backup yes. material. So it's not just, we're not just talking. You have backup workbook and yes. videos. Okay, yes, you have ahead. videos, weekly videos that we go through. We have discussions based on the videos. Of course, even life conversations that come up and uh, you have your workbook. So you have homework assignments every week. So it's not that difficult, but what it actually does. And I think one of our other um, members um, from the group was actually here. And she said for her, it was more about self-discovery. It, the program allowed her to see her. It was not about you having to point the finger at the partner or the spouse or the ex-spouse to say, you, you, you No, this is a journey about you your own healing and what can happen, the transformation that can happen for you and how you can better position yourselves even for your children, if in fact you are a parent. So it's definitely, um, I'm excited about it that this group, they, they proved to me you know, that it really is necessary. And they've already told me, there are so many other people that lined up just waiting Absolutely. for the next cohort. And I, I'll actually put this little plug right here. I actually got a, a, a nice little DM, as a matter of fact, as we're talking to say, please let them know when the next cohort is. And this is actually a, <laughs> somebody from our current group who's saying you need to let them know when the next cohort is. But we're definitely starting our next cohort for Janu in January, January 23rd for 2022. And we're excited. We're already starting the preparations for it to make ourselves ready and, and, and open up to receive those persons that would want to be a part of it. Okay, I saw we had a hand in the room. I don't know, she's still on this girl. I saw your hand. Um, this was somebody who was a part of our group. I don't know if you still have your question. I saw your hands was raised. Okay, maybe not. She probably changed her mind. All right, my co, I know my co-host, he had a question, the one and only Mr. David Williams. Um, David, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask your question. Um, because I joined you late, what I would have uh, wanted to hear, I don't know if you shared any, any of the um, solutions, uh, the challenges that persons go through, and specifically me being a male. So obviously, my question is going to relate to male. How do men deal with when they go through situations of divorce? From any one of you or both of you. Well, I, I, well since I was the last one speaking, I'll just put this plug in here. The divorce care group is for men as well. So it's not just for women. And I think it's important that we state that it's not just for women. Divorce care program is for men as well. So if there are any men that's under the sound of my voice, I implore you, I invite you to be a part of what it is that we're doing. We would love to have men to be a part of the experience because yet again, it helps us with having a balanced conversation. We can have conversation as women and we could give our perspective as women. But if we also have men that's a part of the conversation as well, because men go through a whole lot of experiences, even through the separation, the divorce, they have experiences as well. And we want to, to see where the men, as well as the women, that we're both coming together, joining efforts and going through the process of healing. So I would just put that plug in there to say men can be a part of divorce care as well. There's support that's available for both male and female. Thank you so very much. Um, I hope I got all the questions in the interest of time. It's 5.16, so we're um, past our time. Um, I want to say thank you so very much to these um, brave, strong, courageous women in the house and in the room um, talking on the taboo subject of divorce. I trust that as a result of this hour with us, that you walk to, you walk away with information that will cause you to pause, think, reflect, and make good decisions. The show is all about, you know, it's an educational show, and we believe that God is able to do all things. Um, and and uh, our pastor and both um, Rhea had God at the center of it all. So thank you so much for staying with us to the very end. Thank you for your patience. We know we started um, a bit late, but you've been a wonderful audience. So thank you. Thank you. Before we end, I would just allow, um, I'm going to call it Pastor Rhea. Pastor Rhea. Prophetic Pastor Rhea to have her closing comments. And then we would end with my senior pastor, Pastor Rosemary Ampina, give her her last comment. And then I'll turn um, the lectern over to the one and only Mr. David Williams. So Rhea, then Pastor, and then David. Thank you so much, Jackie. I just want to, my final comments would be, you know, we do not 
have to be in that place where we are suffering in silence. And I, I want to go right back to that because that's, I think for me, that's really the core of what it is. And being able to understand it's a painful experience and it's a painful, it, it, I mean, just to have to go through it by yourself, it is highly, it's not recommended. So I strongly, strongly, strongly want to encourage those persons. If you or somebody that you know might be in that space, we at Legacy say, listen, you see my hand, my arms? My arms are actually open really wide to receive you as you come. You know, I had a converse, quick conversation after church today and someone said, no, I know somebody. I said, listen, I'm ready to receive her as she comes. So we are sitting, we're not sitting, we're actually standing in a position ready to receive you as you come. Um, and we're all about healing. We're all about transforming lives. Come and be healed. Let's, let's journey through this together. It's not something we just simply talk about. But I, I'm sure that even by way of the women that would have participated in this particular cohort, we actually journey literally, literally with you. And we're not going to leave any man standing behind. So I want to encourage anybody that wants to be a part of the, the, the cohort, please do reach out to Legacy Church. You can find us on, as a matter of fact, social media. Um, even if you need to send... <laughs> Any and everywhere on social media, you'll find Legacy Church. But if you're not able to find Legacy Church, you can find, I'm sure you'll find myself or as well as PM. You might find us on social media. I'm sure, but I'll be Ria Christina on social media. You can send me a DM and I'll be sure to make sure that you get the information. We're starting our next cohort January 23rd. It will run for another 13 weeks. And I invite you to be a part of it. Tell somebody about it. There's help. There's help. There's hope. You do not have to suffer in silence. Let's do this together. Amen. I will say, you know, um, like Jacqueline said, uh, we put the Lord at the center of everything. And the beauty of our God is that he meets us at every point of need. And I do not believe that um, for anyone um, that divorce is that thing that God says, well, my hands are off of your life now. He will meet you in the grief process. He will meet you um, at every space where your soul needs healing. He's the God who stoops to heal. He'll come down to where you are at and meet you exactly where you are at emotionally, physically, et cetera. Um, I saw the comment from Francis, divorce is uh, a new beginning um, and not the end of your life. It is not, uh, but what we, what we want to insert is um, the healing process, right? Because a lot of us go through these very traumatic moments in our lives and we don't take care of our soul health. Uh, like Pastor YPJ said in his, in his clip, for those of you that were on when he talked about his own process, that he didn't pause to take care of himself and heal um, so that he can be um, better for his own future. You deserve healing. Um, and God is, is Jehovah Rapha. He's the Lord, our healer. We have to emphasize that. We're going to bring Pastor YPJ down next year, by the way. Um, he'll be at Legacy at some point. Um, but so I would say this, and, and again, uh, uh, Pastor Williams asked a question, what about the men? Listen, we are opening the doors, not just for women. Uh, we have a burden for um, everyone because the, the church has indeed discarded the divorced in a lot of ways, um, have kept them from functioning. And if you have divorce in your history, then something's wrong with you. That's not our messaging. We're creating a space for your healing. That's male and female. Um, but if you're not comfortable, men, yet engaging in a um, group therapy kind of sessions, which is what divorce care really is, then you should still pursue your healing, pursue your healing through your relationship with the Lord and sign up for therapy, get a counselor. I went to um, through therapy in my process because the Lord wouldn't let me sit down from pastoring. I had uh, a lot of different ways that I maneuvered around my process and my healing and I'm still uh, engaging my own healing because mental health is and healing is necessary for all of us. What we know is that we have a God who cares about every single part of you, every part of your life, 
And what we're inviting you into is really for you to lean into your healing so you can navigate in your future in a more whole and holistic way. Your future requires that you take a pause and process through the trauma, process through the grief, process through the pain, process through everything that you have gone through. What we do in the church a lot of times, especially for religious, is that we repress, suppress, and we move forward. And the reality is this, that at some point you'll find out that you moved forward, forward in time, but you did not fo move forward in life. What we want you to do is move forward in your life. And so it's going to take a pause and it's going to require that you pay attention um, to your soul and present your soul for healing. And this is just one of the avenues that we are presenting to you in the capable hands of Ria uh, Christina. She is an amazing leader. She is uh, a great human being. Her, her grace is beyond pastoring, is really apostolic. And so she's a pioneer woman, woman builder. I told her that this divorce care is gonna go and grow bigger than she has ever imagined. And, and so we wanna present you with also a platform for you to give back. As you heal, you heal others as well that are going through the same journey. So there's a great future ahead. Um, there's a life to live. There's life beyond divorce. Um, there's life beyond any kind of trauma that you've been through. I'm long winded preacher, Jacqueline, if you let me, I'm going to keep talking, but we're just, we're just asking you to join us on the journey towards your healing so that your life will be fruitful in the future. Whatever you don't deal with now, we'll deal with you later. And we just want you to live your life free and healed and whole. Okay, thanks. Um, just before I close, I want to call Dr. McMillan. Dr. Mark, if you're still here, Dr. Mark would have been married for over 50 plus years, uh, as, as well as he's a, a pastor, a financial ana analysis. And so I'm sure over his 50 plus years, there's a lot of couples would have come to him, um, persons would have went through a uh, divorce. Dr. Mark, what can you share with us based on your 50 plus years of as in ministry as well as being married? Dr. Mark. Um, Dr. Mark, I hope everybody can unmute your mic. Can anybody else unmute your mic for me, please? Check if you can unmute your mic. Okay, I don't know. Let me see. Go back to the, to the, to the meeting settings. I'm hoping that um, folks can unmute your mic. Can anybody else try for me for a minute just to see if you can unmute your mic other than the host, co-host? Or maybe they could type, Jackie, as they type in the chat. Jackie. Hi. Okay, say, can you, is there something, uh, can you use your control from the computer to unmute? That may be I, a, may, may be a challenge because Pastor Williams would have left us. Um, meeting settings. I don't know. Is, uh, can anybody unmute now? Can you try it for me for a minute? Anybody, just unmute. Okay, I guess we have been, okay, they can't, they can't unmute. All right, still, okay, somebody said still unable to. Okay, um, we gotta apologize. Um, normally our, and I'm, and I'm just looking through to, to see if there's something that I can see. I see mute upon entry, but I don't know Who anyway. Who are you trying to get to unmute? Um, I just want, anybody can unmute. I was just saying if anybody could unmute, other than us. McMullen is unmuted. It was just muted back just now. Okay, he's un. Okay, so let me try it again. And let me see. Maybe it might have been something I might have done. You're saying, okay, um, Dr. Oh, Mark, can you unmute now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I think I did something. Okay, go ahead, Doc. Yeah, I was telling them you are 50 years of ministry. You have many years of marriage, 50 years of marriage, many years of ministry. So I'm sure. Persons would have come across in your space who were divorced, single, and whatever. But since we're talking about divorce care, what words of advice, what would you share with them? Thank you very much, Dave. But I have to take a deep breath and exhale 
before I speak, but those who know me on this platform and know anything about me, after 61 years of marriage to the same lady and the three wonderful girls and seven grandchildren and just a simply happy life. I mean, love life and marriage life. Yet, just as you said, in ministry for over 45, 50 years, dealing with all kinds of marriages and divorces in different societies. I've been in the Latin world, English, French, but I'm saying all of that just to get to this point. For me, the answer is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. It may sound out of step and so forth, but uh, what Jesus offers to the subject as a person, a divine person, and I'll begin with the two things that nobody on the platform or, or anywhere else can offer, only he. And that's number one, eternal life. There's nobody on this platform now or anywhere that can offer eternal life to two divorced people or someone who overcomes. They can't. It's only Christ. And then number two, uh, forgiveness, self-forgiveness, or any other kind of forgiveness will not last, except it is the kind of forgiveness that comes from this person, Jesus Christ, by faith. Having said that, any person with the different situations, different things that's happening, uh, uh, how should I put it, outlook toward divorce, I'm talking about churches and organization, how they look at it. I heard that somebody mentioned that, that there's a church he knew that said divorce was the unpardonable sin. That is impossible when it comes to Christ because there's no sin that's unpardonable with him. There's none. And anyone who thinks otherwise uh, is not correct. Christ came to take away sin and there's none that he could not and does not. Having said that, he leads people into recovery. We heard it all said this afternoon that he is the great physician. He heals, he forgives, he causes persons to bear heavy burdens, and then if anyone comes to him, he uses them as an example of his glory in, in, in a relationship, in anything. And finally, when it's all over, when it's all over, and it is going to be all over for me one day after 60 odd years, for someone with only two years, it's gonna be over in the sense that we will fall asleep, we will die. And the only thing that matters at that time is to die in Christ so that you can live again. So from my standpoint, I deal with Christ now in every situation, trusting him as a person to handle all aspect of that situation. And the reason for that is that, there, that he can offer two things that nobody else can offer. And that's life eternal and eternal forgiveness. Having offered that, he takes care of all the rest for his glory and our good. That's my contribution. It is an experiential contribution. If you haven't experienced it, there's no way you can understand all that I just said. But for those who know this Christ that I'm talking about, you know him, not his teachings, not his life. You know, some folks say study his life. No, man, I know him. And then he takes over. That's the difference. Sorry you asked me, Dave, but that's what I have to share. Okay, so folks, I just want to thank you. We have to sign off the radio now. Um, I want to thank those of you, Pastor Rosemary, Pastor Rhea Butler, Pastor Jackie Gardner, Dr. McMillan, everybody, I want to thank you. One of the things on this program, Transforming Lives, and for those of you who don't know, I'm talking about our two pastors, but if you know Jackie, Transforming as a Life is a program that talks about and acknowledge that the only way a life can be transformed is through Jesus Christ. And so I just want to thank those of you listening in live on Global 99.5, all the way from Grand Bahama in the north to Inago in the south. 
Those of you on cable TV 974, YouTube channel Uplifting Men Transforming Lives, our Facebook page Transforming Lives, Jackie Gardner, David Williams, NG Reboot, Uplifting Men. You've been listening to this program we hear every Sunday, nine to five, Transforming Lives, Global 99.5. And we end the way we always end by reminding you and I that there's nothing more important than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about your church. I'm not talking about my church. I'm not talking about your denomination. And I'm not talking about my denomination. I am talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who gives us eternal life now. Dave Williams, Jackie Gardner, Transforming Lives. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>